the first of five Iranian oil tankers docks in Venezuela. Burundi's ruling party candidate has been declared winner of the presidential elections. And the World Health Organization suspends clinical trials of hydroxychloroquine as a potential treatment for COVID-19. Tune in to find out why. While the data, the safety data... Welcome to Telesur, I'm Carla Gonzalez. This is from the South. The first oil tanker, Fortune, has docked in the port of Puerto Cabello in northern Carabobo State in Venezuela. The tanker has already started to unload fuel and other oil products to the El Palito refinery. Minister of Petroleum Tarek El Aysami thanked the Iranian government for its act of solidarity during the global crisis. He said the delivery is an example of peace diplomacy and nations expressing their right to economic freedom. Our correspondent, Leonel Retamal, has more. This is the oil tanker Fortune, the first of the five Iranian ships arriving to Venezuela to unload fuel. The delivery will help the South American nation tackle gasoline shortages that came by due to unliteral sanctions imposed by the United States on the country. Iran and Venezuela are political and economic partners. And with this successful delivery, they are sending a message to the U.S. that the sanctions will not stop these two countries. The ship's crew is already in touch with the officials at the state oil company, PDVSA, as they begin unloading the cargo. They are unloading the cargo at the El Palito refinery in Puerto Cabello, about three hours from Caracas. from Caracas. Iranian oil tankers have started to arrive in Venezuela in what became a significant show of solidarity between two nations besieged by U.S. economic sanctions. All the operations by Venezuela's Strategic Operational Command in international waters went by successfully and in peace. There's more in this report. The sunset highlighted the most anticipated moment. This marked a breaking point in geopolitics. Venezuela ships entered international waters to meet the first of five oil tankers hailing from Iran that set sail three weeks ago, carrying fuel for the Venezuelan people. But beyond breaking the U.S. blockade, this image of the 14 ship and the ocean patrol ship Yekwana writes a new page in the history of defending international law. This is how the mission to score the tankers began. Alert, Fortune Tanker. This is Ocean Patrol, ship your corner of Venezuelan Navy. We are 60 nautical miles outside our territorial waters. We are here to accompany you to port in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. The Patriots men in this ship left behind Venezuela on Friday, May 22nd, headed to meet the Iranian ships. As such, this operation for dignity began. Day two of the mission. The young crew prepared for a long day. Their mission just starting. We are on our way to meet the Iranian tanker and escort them to Margarita Island. We are in the right position to meet the tanker. Expectations rose as time went by. Five hours later, the first Iranian ship appeared. We have visual contact with the Fortune tanker. We are informing the Navy commanders that we have spotted the ship. Peace won. Now the ships made their way to Venezuela. We are showing the world that we are not alone. U.S. Venezuelans are making allies around the world and are showing that a U.S. blockade can be broken. 
This is a peace mission. This is not meant to threaten anyone. We are exercising our rights as a free and sovereign country. We have a right to carry out commercial and financial activities with our fellow nations, to cooperate without threatening anyone. International waters were left behind. Multilateralism won the day. At around 8 p.m., after 26 hours at sea, they entered Venezuelan jurisdiction. In the name of our president of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and the commander in chief of the armed forces and all the Venezuelan people, we thank you for the support of the Republic of Iran that has been traveling with its three tankers transporting fuel for the Venezuelan people who are affected by the economic blockade imposed by the United States government. The captain of the first Iranian oil tanker to enter Venezuela thanked the support and show of friendship by the government. And uh, the government? This escort mission is still awaiting the rest of the oil tankers arriving to Venezuela, which are all expected to be here over the next 10 days. Meanwhile, the second of five Iranian tankers carrying fuel to the Republic of Venezuela has officially entered its waters. The tanker called Forest was met by Venezuelan naval patrol boats north of Margarita and is headed towards the port of El Palito, where one of the country's refineries is located. The third ship, which is called Petunia, is expected to arrive on May 26. The entire fleet is carrying about 1.5 million barrels of gasoline. The U.S., which has imposed sanctions on both Venezuela and Iran, says it is monitoring the convoy, while Caracas and Tehran have warned Washington not to interfere with the delivery. In other news, Ecuadorians across the country have taken to the streets to protest against the government of Lenin Moreno. In Quito, workers' unions and teachers gather near the presidential palace to reject economic measures recently imposed by the government. Protesters say the coronavirus crisis has only affected lower and middle income families, while the rich has been left mostly unfaced. They also reject the government's neoliberal policies and vow to continue protesting until their demands are met. The president is lying to the country. He says we are the first country to invest heavily in the health sector to fight COVID-19, but it is a lie. He speaks of education, but has laid off more than 6,000 teachers and is cutting their salaries. Meanwhile, large companies will pay nothing during the crisis. This is a government that only takes care of big businesses, bankers and the International Monetary Fund. We are all against these neoliberal measures. We will continue mobilizing until justice is achieved. The working class shouldn't have to carry the burden of the crisis. And later, protesters were repressed by police forces as they tried to reach the presidential palace. Hundreds of people in Santo Domingo Square were blocked by police vehicles and faced tear gas. Our correspondent, Denise Herrera, sent a report from the middle of the protest. We are now in Quito, where several organizations of workers, students, are gathered here in rejection of the economic measures announced by President Lenin Moreno. According to the government, they are taking all the preventive measures to face this health crisis in relation with the COVID-19 situation. As you can see behind me, here, all Ecuadorian workers are today rejecting these economic measures. They said that Moreno is affecting directly their rights. They are rejecting also the recent speech given by President Lenin Moreno. We should remember that yesterday Moreno gave his presidential report. Moreno said that the government is taking all the preventive measures to stop with the spread of the COVID-19 situation. 
According to Moreno, these economic reforms will help the economic situation in Ecuador. Meanwhile, as you can see, several organizations of workers in Ecuador are rejecting today these announcements. Today, they will stay here in the uh, Diez Avenida, the Diez Agosto Avenue here in Quito, and they are saying that Moreno has to stop with these neoliberal decisions. Tenis Herrera from Quito. Meanwhile, in the southern port city of Guayaquil, which remains the coronavirus epicenter in the country, protesters also took to the streets. Hundreds marched on the city's main avenue to show the rejection of the government. While in the city of Cuenca, students defied lockdown measures and marched on the streets against massive cuts in the education sector. We're taking a short break now. Join us again in a minute. Welcome back. More news at this hour. Voting has been extended until 9 p.m. in Suriname in a vote to determine whether President Desi Buterzi, who has been found guilty of murder and sentenced to 20 years in prison, will continue to lead the country. Authorities lifted a partial coronavirus lockdown this Monday to facilitate voting. Voters lined up a meter apart and polls opened at 7 a.m. Just over 380,000 people are eligible to elect the 51 members of the National Assembly, which will then elect the president. Buterzi is seeking a third term in office. Trinidad and Tobago is now the eighth Caribbean country to be declared virus-free with zero active cases of COVID-19. On Friday, the Ministry of Health disclosed that the last active patient has been discharged from the hospital. This brings the total number of recoveries to 108 and 8 dead. The other Caribbean nations to have zero active cases includes St. Lucia, Dominica, St. Kitts and Nevis, Belize, Anguilla, Montserrat and St. Barthelemy. Youth activists have toppled colonial status in Martinique's capital, Fort de France, which they describe as insulting portraits of the nation's colonial past. The activists destroyed the statue of Victor Schwelcher, a former French colonial official, among others. They say while Schwelcher abolished slavery on the island in 1848, he was also in favor of compensating slave owners, which has led to the unfair distribution of wealth between the descendants of plantation owners and descendants of slaves. Alors ceci est un message euh, à la gendarmerie de la Martinique, la police, les forces armées, les juges, les magistrats. Nous assumons pleinement notre acte. The United States has imposed a travel ban on foreigners coming from Brazil to stem the spread of the coronavirus. Taking effect from Sunday, the measure denies entry to all foreigners who have been in Brazil in the 14-day period prior to when they sought admittance to the U.S. The White House said the ban aims to prevent that sources of additional infections enter the country. With more than 360,000 confirmed cases, Brazil now has the second biggest caseload in the world after the United States. The Donald Trump administration has also banned flights from China, the U.K. and other countries in Europe. Brazilians have been left outraged after a video emerged last Friday which shows the ministers pushing President Jair Bolsonaro further towards fascism. Our correspondent Brian Mir in Sao Paulo has the details. Many Brazilians are furious over a video of a presidential cabinet meeting released by the Supreme Court last Friday which shows ministers goading President Bolsonaro further towards fascism. Do gymnastics, sing the national anthem, salute. Study citizenship in the afternoons, discipline, use the time constructively, use volunteers to build the highways, to do this and that. Yemen did it during its reconstruction. Bolsonaro's education minister, Abraham Weintraub, has already drawn criticism for speeches in which he simply exchanges the word communists for Jews in passages lifted directly from Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. 
The communists are at the top of the nation. They are at the top of the financial organizations. They are the owners of the newspapers. They are the owners of the big corporations. They are the owners of the monopolies. During the cabinet meeting, Minister Weintraub, whose failed plan to gut the public university system drew millions of protesters to the streets in 2019, called on the president to start arbitrarily arresting non-allied government officials. The people are crying for freedom. I think that this is what we are losing here. The people want to see what brought me here. If it were up to me, I would throw all these bombs in jail, starting with the federal Supreme Court. The anger continues to grow. For the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic began, Bolsonaro was forced to flee from protesters during a public outing in Brasilia the day after the video was released. Brian Mir, Telesur, Sao Paulo. In other news, the remains of 60 mammoths have been found at an airport under construction north of Mexico City. Mexican archaeologists said the remains date back to 12,000 years and the animals likely got stuck in the mud of the Asian lake and died. The shallow lake apparently produced generous quantities of grass and reeds, which attracted mammoths. The location is also near human-built traps, where more than a dozen mammoths were found last year. Burundi's ruling party candidate Evariste Ndayashimiye has been declared winner of the presidential elections. According to the country's election commission, Ndaye Shimiye won 68.7% of the vote, while his main opposition rival, Agathon Rasa of the National Freedom Council, had only 24.19%. The election took place without any international election observers and with scant regard to the coronavirus pandemic, which is being largely ignored by the government. A top DR Congo government official has pleaded innocent as a historic trial for alleged corruption resumes. Vital Kamere, a top aide to DR Congo's Mashan president, Mizasa. Felix Chisekedi, is accused with others of having embezzled more than $50 million from funds for building homes for poor people. They are also accused of embezzling another $2 million from a program to build housing for police and the military. During Monday's court session, Kamere requested bail after the high-profile proceedings resumed following a two-week break. I would like someone to help me. I will answer your question, your honor, but I would like someone to help me understand why I am in Makala with regard to this first charge. I would like to understand at what level Mr. Kamere helped Mr. Jamal to defraud the central bank since there is no document that I signed for the payment of 57 million 600. There you go. He knows his figure well. Countries on the African continent are celebrating Africa Day under this year's theme, silencing the guns in the context of COVID-19. Leaders have spoken on the need for the continent to stop wars and work together to fight the illness. The day is celebrated annually on May 25th, commemorates Africa's freedom and liberation from colonial rule. It also marks the founding of the Regional Integration Body, the Organization of the African Unity, formed on May 25, 1963, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, hosted by the late Emperor of Ethiopia, Hale Selassie. This African Union now. There is no time to waste. We must unite or we perish. More stories after this break. Don't go away. Thank you for joining us again. The World Health Organization has suspended clinical trials of hydroxychloroquine as a potential treatment for COVID-19. The decision came after the publication last week of a study indicating that using the drug on COVID-19 patients could increase their likelihood of dying. The drug is normally used to treat arthritis, but pronouncements from public figures, including U.S. President Donald Trump and Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro, has prompted governments to bulk buy the med medicine. The executive group has implemented a temporary 
pause of the hydroxychloroquine arm within the solidarity trial while the data, the safety data, is reviewed by the Data Safety Monitoring Board. The other arms of the trial are continuing. French healthcare workers have protested over low salaries, staff shortage, and risky working conditions. Dozens of protesters gather outside the Ministry of Health to call on the French government to honor its pledge on salary increases, which they say was promised even before the coronavirus pandemic hit the country. The government also promised to absorb 10 billion euros of hospital debt, giving the system the ability to take on new loans for investments. As far as salaries are concerned, this is a major issue. Why is this so? Because carers are too poorly paid. The career is no longer attractive. Here, we have vacancies because there are no nurses who want to work in these conditions. So the issue of salary is not an adjustment. 300 euros more is a real salary increase. That's what we are asking for. It would make this profession more attractive and therefore simply have fewer recruitment problems. Spaniards can once again enjoy bars and parks in the cities of Madrid and Barcelona as more and more European countries have begun easing coronavirus lockdown measures. However, people can only stay in the terraces of the bars and cafes and restaurants in groups no bigger than 10 people. For now, traveling between regions is still forbidden and any foreign visitors arriving in Spain are still required to undergo 14 days of quarantine. We were very eager to meet, and the truth is that we were excited to see each other again. We are on this terrace that is very safe everything. We have here the hydroalcoholic gel that we put on every two minutes. The mask and nothing. We are happy to see each other. Staying in Spain, the government has revised downward the country's COVID-19 death toll by nearly 2,000, bringing the total number to over 26,000. This is due to several factors. We are correcting those series that I tell you, validating the data, eliminating duplicates, eliminating people who were put as dead or reported as cases of coronavirus that we later released. The autonomous communities have released that they were suspicious or probable cases, but not confirmed. In Denmark, the Copenhagen Zoo, one of the oldest in Europe, has reopened its doors to visitors after a month-long closure due to the coronavirus pandemic. It was the first time the zoo closed its doors in its 151-year history. In Ukraine, the Kiev metro has welcomed back passengers after more than two months of lockdown, with some sanitary measures still in place. Posters at platforms urge citizens to practice social distancing of at least 1.5 meters and wear masks. Officers also carry out spot checks of passengers' temperatures. But the metro, which normally transports 1.5 million people daily, remained deserted on Monday with only 20 passengers or fewer in each car, even during rush hour. I think that the opening of the subway is very important. The city needs to work, the city needs to live, study. People need to travel to different places. Communal transport was very limited. During quarantine, I cycled, walk, or took taxis. In Kyrgyzstan, economic activities have resumed in the capital Bishkek, and people slowly trickle back to shopping malls. We are all glad that quarantine has finished, but I went out onto the street of Bishkek today and you know, there were not that many people. It is probably because students are still sitting at home, distant learning. And our last story, a 15-year-old Indian girl has traveled 1,200 kilometers by bike, carrying her injured father to return home after the coronavirus lockdown left them destitute. Jyoti Kumari traveled for seven days from Delhi to Darbanga to bring her injured father home since they couldn't pay for transportation. Her father lost his job when the country was shut down in an attempt to curb the spread of the virus. They survived the journey thanks to people offering them water and food along the way.
Kumari's extraordinary efforts also caught the attention of the Cycling Federation of India, which offered her the chance to try out for the country's team. And with that story, we end our news brief. But you can find these and more on our website, tennisorenglish.net. And be sure to follow health protocols where you are. For Tennis or English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Until next time.